on cornerofthegalaxy.com. It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, the show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the mind of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on a Monday, March 11th. LA Galaxy getting a 2-2 draw with Nashville over the weekend. Sunday afternoon game. If you thought you were sad because the Galaxy won, or you thought you were mad because the Galaxy were losing, or you're angry that they just got a draw, then you're probably all right because uh, that game was an interesting one. We're going to talk about that, get you through all the particulars in there, break that all down. An L.A. Galaxy assistant coach is arrested after a drunken night in Nashville. We're going to start out with that here in just a couple seconds. And then, of course, we're going to get you through all the rest of the L.A. Galaxy news, including some U.S. Open Cup and Jovan Karofsky on his way to AC Milan. A lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of things to get to to help us do all of that. We're glad to have him back. It's Kevin, the Panda Baxter. Kev, how you doing, bud? I I need a haircut. I need a haircut, too. I, I agree. We're both a little shaggy right now. That's okay, though. It seems like I've spent the last entire three weeks with the women's national team, and then I looked it up. It's only 19 days. <laughs> it just, but I it did just get felt to like see three weeks? It, yeah, it felt like three weeks. I did get to see a game played in a quagmire, though. It's a monsoon. Oh, really? That Wednesday semifinal game. You didn't see the highlights of that? It was it was, it was was bizarre. I, I did see some of that, and I saw the the whole thing. So were you you were in the press box for that, though. You didn't actually get rained on, right? Yeah, but, well, yeah, yes and no. I was in the press box, but I... Uh, you know, I, my seat was in the front row and they didn't put down, they have like a little tarp thing they can put down. They didn't put that down at Snapdragon. So my, my work area was underwater. So I had to go work in the back. I understand. Watch it, I had to watch it on TV, which I could have watched it on TV from home. You, you could, I mean, absolutely. You could have watched it. That was, that's, that's one of the things that sometimes gets me is like, we can, we can mostly, especially with zoom calls nowadays, you can kind of do this job from home. I just, I think that you get a better experience when you're there and you did get to see some, some pretty interesting games and, and the whole deal. So, I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, you're winning, you get free live soccer. I said, if you want to be a reporter and get free live soccer, then, then this is the job for you. Free live soccer, well, no and, pay, and then, no pay, yeah, but free well, no live pay. soccer. Yes. But then I get to, you know, you go down and talk to the players afterward and all that kind of stuff. So you, you do really need to be there. But I had to drive down to San Diego for the semifinals, drive back, then drive back for the final. And my wife and I were talking today. I, I spent more time driving to and from San Diego than I did actually watching soccer. Yeah, you did. Absolutely. 100%. Not a, not a lie. You, did you, 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 I did get to watch and I, I sort of, one, I want to say two things. Let me gather my thoughts here. Two things. One is Mr. Michael Araujo, who does the announcements for us, who is the PA announcer for the Angels and, of course, the LA Galaxy. Um, he visited me at the train club on Sunday, so I got to say hi to him. So he wanted me to say hi to you. I don't know why he likes you, but hi. he does. So um, he wanted me to say hi to you. But it was great having him come out uh, with some of his uh, his family. We got to go for a little train ride. So that was it was very gorgeous day. Absolutely beautiful. Um, so always nice getting out there. Um, and then uh, two was that coming and watching that game after I had a, had to run a birthday party at the train club in the morning. And then I got home basically in time to really catch the entirety of the second half. But I was listening to basically the last 25, 30 minutes of the first half. So I got most of the game uh, while I was going um, was, 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 was tiring 
That game was tiring, Kevin. It went from, if you watched the announcers and you saw everything that was going on, it was like, oh, well, the LA Galaxy now only have, you know, a 0.1% chance of winning. And by the way, they only have like a 2% chance of drawing whenever they're down to nothing. So just uh, a crazy game in, in all sorts of ways. So those are my Speaking those are of my the train thoughts. club, is there a COG discount if you come by? And, I don't and know. How, your, I don't know. Your little COG, like, right. Little right. round thing. I yeah. got one right here. Here it is. Yeah. If you bring this by, what do, what do you what do you get? Yeah, I mean, you get a free train ride. That's what you get. Oh, okay. But I mean, all oh. our train rides are free. It's kind of like here. Do oh. I, okay. Whenever I pay you double, it's still double <laughs> times zero, right? So. Okay. Uh, that's how uh, that's how we got there. Uh, before we get too deep into this, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, to somebody who's been uh, sort of. Uh, hinting at a fact that they're going to be at all of the home LA Galaxy games, or certainly trying to be at all the home LA Galaxy games. Uh, Foot Pull America uh, will be there. If you go over to the concert area, um, and then you come back from that, uh, you can sort of see that Foot Pool has, has their pool table sort of set up, and they also have their little arena in there as well. And so um, they wanted to give everybody a shout out, said that they listened to the show, and so they certainly appreciate everybody. And if you want to give them a follow on Instagram, uh, at Foot Pool America is where you can find them. They have all sorts of uh, events where they can bring these things to your house. And so, so, I mean, it just looks like a fun, fun sort of game. So if you're in the area, if you're going to the game like this Saturday when the LA Galaxy will take on St. Louis, Go over and look and see if foot pool is open and see if they have their little uh, their little uh, arena there where you can go one on one. And uh, in the video that we have playing, somebody wearing a Mike McGee jersey. I'm guessing it's not yeah. Mike McGee, but somebody no, wearing a, a Mike sweet, McGee jersey. A sweet retro Mike McGee jersey. If you're not watching this podcast, then you're missing everything. As, it's, uh, pretty as, sweet. As of course it is. So anyway, shout out to uh, foot pool. All right. Let's dive into this, and uh, let me just say that this show has been planned for most of the day, and Kevin and I were fine and well with all the things that we were ready to plan, and then there was a breaking news report that sort of came out, um, and so What's now we- breaking news music? Do we have breaking news music? No, we don't. I sh really should have something, though. Um, let me see if I can find something on the fly real quick. Let's see. No, that's no, that's no good. We don't want to go that way. Of course, it wants to load everything now, so it wants to be slow. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no- that's the, oh. that doesn't seem like it. What, uh, yeah. How about breaking news? Oh, wait, hold on. I didn't do it right. <laughs> nope, that's not it. Either. So that's so, not breaking news. Breaking news. You know, no, um, I have no idea. We, oh, this one. Oh, very nice. Breaking news. No, that doesn't seem like it is. So no, we don't have breaking news. Just wanted to let you okay. know. So breaking news here, and uh, let's get right to it. But LA Galaxy assistant coach Nick Thessloff was jailed after a drunken night in Nashville. That's the scoop from Scoop Nashville. Uh, we've been working to confirm the details of this, and we will tell you as much as we can. Um, although confirming anything right now seems like it's a little murky. Uh, what we know is that the 48-year-old was jailed in Nashville early Saturday morning. Um, and this is from Scoop Nashville. We're actually looking to get our hands on the police report. We haven't, we have no police report for us yet, right, Kevin? No, actually, that's not true. Oh, you, um, you, you, oh, okay. Yes, so these uh, changes. Already. Davidson, uh, D Nashville is in, D is in Davidson County. And so we did see the Davidson County booking report. It doesn't go into the details that, uh, uh Scoop Nashville did where in Scoop Nashville, there's a description of, uh, at his an encounter with uh, sheriff's deputies. They don't have police in Nashville. They have sheriff's deputies. His encounter with sheriff's deputies and and apparently spit on a waitress at a at a restaurant or a bar. Oh, no, a security um, guard was a security, a security guard. guard. I'm yes. sorry. Mm -hmm. And then, but we did see the Davidson County booking record, and it did say that he was booked and released. They spoke to a, a spokesperson at the jail. He was booked uh, on Saturday morning, released a hundred dollar bond. Um, and then was allowed to go on his way. I don't know if he has a court. I, I, I would assume that he has a court date. Right. Unless well, this was handled some other way. Well, it, um, right now, the booking and, and the charge is public intoxication, right? So there's no assaults or anything like that right now. Um, that's all they're saying is public intoxication. And I can't, as Kevin rightfully pointed out, I don't think we can verify any of the stuff that's in Scoop Nashville yet. Um, but, we have not been able to do that. That was not in the police report, although Scoop Nashville clearly has some sources in the police department. If you look at the, that website, just not just this story, but other stories, um, uh, you know, they have a, uh, they have access to the police blotter in some way or another. Um, but yeah. And, and so you and I both contacted the galaxy right. um, for a statement. And, and I, I did have a conversation with some people at the galaxy. I'm, I have to be careful with what I say because there's some things that, that uh, I know about that I'm not allowed to talk about, but I, I read you the statement that I got from Will Kuntz. Uh, he said the LA Galaxy were made aware of the situation regarding assistant coach Nick Tesloff this morning. The club is still gathering facts and reviewing the matter. 
we have no further comment at this time. And that, that is true because I tried to get him to further comment and he would not do it at this time. So that part is true. Right. Uh, as far as we know, Nick was on the, uh, the MLS roster sheet. He was You're supposed correct. to be on the sidelines. My understanding is that um, he participated in team activities. Now, the team got there Friday. Correct. Okay, they, Friday. So, so let, let's go over the timeline just so that way we can sort of piece some of this together. And the timeline is the LA Galaxy trained on Friday morning. And according to their schedule, they flew out after training, which was uh, interesting just to see them fly almost a full day out before the game because the game basically kicked off. Uh, 12 p.m. on the Pacific t- Pacific time um, on, in Nashville on a Sunday. So they flew in Friday night or Friday afternoon. I would imagine getting there probably Friday night whenever they uh, whenever they finally land and then train on Saturday, sort of walk through stuff. And then they were, were going to play on Sunday. That was the timeline that was laid out by the Galaxy in their uh, in their communications. Right. So he was arrested after midnight Friday, Saturday morning. Right. Was apparently in a car. Um, that it kind of got me is like to do, you know, the, the teams generally travel everywhere by bus. They go to training by bus and back Do coaches sometimes rent a car. Did he rent a car on his own? Does Good. he have a friend that gave him a car? That part, I don't know. And that was not anything that was in the police report that we saw. So I don't know about the car part. Um, uh, but you know, he apparently continued to participate in team activities, um, and was at the game Sunday and, um, what I wanted to say about this, though, is, and, and I'm not trying to make any excuses or cover up for him at all. Um, the bond of $100 shows you that the people in Davidson County did not think that this was exactly the crime of the century. I know he did spit on a security officer. In these Supposedly, days of, allegedly. Allegedly. And if that's true in these days of COVID and other communicable diseases, that's that's not a good thing. He did have some words, some choice words for the police officer, allegedly, when they tried to arrest him. That's not cool. And he was behind the wheel of a car, although he wasn't driving. So he wasn't dri- He wasn't charged with or uh, charged with uh, driving under the influence. Yep. Um, he didn't kill anybody. He didn't hurt anybody that we know of, aside from the one security official. So I'm not trying to make excuses for him and 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 um, you know and lessen the severity of this. But what I did want to say is one thing that always bothers me a little bit about being a sports writer and doing this kind of stuff and and journalism in, in general, I guess, is here's a guy. Nick Tesloff is a extremely accomplished guy. He won an NCAA title at UCLA under Ziggy Schmidt. He co- he was an assistant on Germany's 2006 World Cup team and then was an assistant to Jurgen uh, Klinsmann at Bayern Munich, one of the biggest clubs in the world. Came back to the U.S., was assisted at Chivas USA, went to Toronto. Um, I, I think Greg Vanny was part of that whole movement to, from Chivas to Toronto. Yep. Went to Toronto, was on Greg's staff there from 2014 to 2021, followed Greg back to the Galaxy. He's been coaching here um, since Greg came back, so this is his fourth season, you're closer to the Galaxy than anybody. I'm fairly close to the Galaxy. We didn't know who this guy was. So look at all he accomplished. And now he's working for our local team that we cover for four years. Right. And he's from UCLA, and he coached at Chivas, t- another team I covered before. And this is the first, you know, I've heard this guy's name. And, and it's unfortunate that here's a guy that accomplished all this stuff, and we cover the team, and we at some point probably should have been talking about some – contribution that he made to the German national team or to Chivas or to, to the galaxy. And instead, the first time we mention him is when he gets arrested and uh, has to pay a hundred dollar bond because he got drunk. Yeah. It's the disappointing part of all this though. Right. I mean, you sort of sit there, I, listen, rule number one is don't get arrested on a work trip. Right. And by, by all intents and purposes, this is a work trip, right? You, you gotta, you gotta sort of still behave yourself. It, it's funny. If I change the word Nashville for to Las Vegas, I think everybody sort of gets the, the, the reference in terms of what you're, what you're trying to say is like, Hey, what happens in Vegas sort of stays in Vegas, that type of thing. Obviously it doesn't, but if this happened in Vegas, you're like, Oh, this is a party town. Everybody I've been talking to says Nashville is very much in that same vein, which is, uh, well, have you been on party. Broadway in Nashville? I have not, I have not been there. I've it, heard it, it's, it, it's crazy though. Right. It, it may be uh, as bad or worse than Bourbon Street in in New Orleans. It is out of control. Yeah, it yeah. is. Uh, just drunk people all over the place. Um, there's like ro- rolling bachelorette parties and, and huge yes. SUV limousines. It's crazy. The first time I went there, it just blew me away. It's crazy. But, you know, on the other hand, Nick, you know, is in the public eye. He, he did take a job where he's in the public eye. And, and so... You know, it's unfortunate that the first time we're talking about this guy on the show, it's when he he has this kind of run in with the law. But on the other hand, he chose his profession. If he was a stockbroker, he wouldn't be being talked about on Corner of the Galaxy. I, I so, don't 
I don't like this though. The the whole idea is that this happened on basically you go out on a Friday night, you get arrested on early Saturday morning, right? You postpone, you leave. Uh, you probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, by all accounts that I've heard, miss no, no team activities, right? So, you know, we're sort of saying, saying that he was there for everything, but the galaxy didn't know about that until this morning. Don't you, that, that also seems like a lapse in judgment to me. Um, and maybe, maybe there's no need to sort of associate or say, Hey, a hey, LA galaxy, this happened to me whenever I was on a work trip and maybe I need to talk about it. But if the galaxy just found out about it this morning. That's a red flag. We're talking about red flags. Yeah. That's a red flag for me. Well, yeah, I can't comment on that. Like I said, there's some things I can't talk about. Uh, uh, although Will did did say in a statement that he heard of, had heard about it today, Monday, and it allegedly happened Saturday morning. So I think you can probably, you know, um, make some assumptions there. You know, perhaps he thought it was such a minor incident, too, that it was never going to come to anyone's attention. And then right. it wound up on a police blotter and yep. and Scoop Nashville came Yep. came out with it and then we found out about it. so I'm, I'm sure he just thought it was a minor thing or or you know was a, afraid of the re repercussions right i guess the other back thing with this is is this is the la galaxy and we talk about this a lot and i'm not a i'm not a fan i'm a reporter supporters are out there and they have a, a different opinion but when i look at the galaxy it's new york yankees of soccer and th they have a much higher profile and they need to carry themselves in a much higher way this is the team of david beckham and landon donovan um, and you know, Mike McGee, we talked about guys that carried themselves a certain way and they're, and it's like the U S women's national team. We talked about, you have to live up to that reputation. Right. And this is not living up to that reputation. And I'm sure Nick knows that. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll follow this and, uh, and look for any more breaking details. The LA galaxy say that they're investigating. So we will of course follow up with them whenever we can. I think we're a little in the preliminary stage. If this happened probably six hours earlier, we might have been a little further on in, in sort of fact finding and everything else, but that's where we stand right now. So we'll put that aside and be ready to come back to that whenever we need to. But let's talk about the LA galaxy's game against Nashville, because remember in the chronological order of things, Kevin, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday walkthrough, Sunday game at noon, and apparently all carried through on that. So this happened. The game happens after uh, the L.A. Galaxy um, uh, or after uh, Nick Vesloff was was arrested here. So um, an interesting sort of chronological order of events. Not one that I would have guessed. I would have figured maybe after. But I will tell you that after uh, being I was on the, the press conference call, they usually pack up and get out of town pretty fast. Um, so you probably don't have time to do this after. If you're going to do it, it's going to be Friday night for sure. So um, 100 percent. So we'll we'll keep following up on that. You ready to talk about game? We good? We wrapped up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. talk about soccer. That's always a good thing. The L.A. Galaxy get a 2-2 draw with Nashville. And uh, as I said in the opening, if you are angry that the L.A. Galaxy didn't win this game, if you are sad um, that uh, the LA Galaxy drew the game, or if you're happy that they drew the game, I I believe those are all correct. I think I think you got a hundred percent. This was a roller coaster of emotions uh, throughout the entire ninety minutes, but mostly the second half. Remember, it goes zero zero uh, into the first half uh, at the end of the first half, and goes zero zero into the second half. And at one point, uh, in, very early in that second half, uh, Nashville is leading two nothing. So let's talk about the starting lineup. Uh, unchanged for the LA Galaxy, McCarthy, McCarthy and Angol, Yamane, Yoshida, Caceres, and Audeat, uh on defense, Delgado, Cerillo, Puj, uh, and then Fagundes, um, sort of in that Puj, Fagundes, and Paintsil, uh, and then Jovalich up top. So in the very much the 4-3-3 that we have been watching the LA Galaxy play with. Interesting for Nashville, though, and Greg Vanny commented on this, Nashville playing a back five, the first time the Galaxy have gone up against a back five um, in this, and... If you think about it, the back five, very much a reaction to one Joseph Paintsil and what he's able to do. And so if you want to see why Joseph Paintsil was frustrated in this game, and if you watch this game, he was. Um, it's because Nashville basically dedicated at least one guy to him at all times. And then in a lot of cases, especially whenever you get the ball, there would be two guys out on him uh, closing down stuff. So you're already seeing the isolating factors that can sort of lead somebody like Joseph Paintsil to draw all the attention. This is why. Do, do yeah, go ahead. Do you think it happened? It, maybe it was also a factor that they lost Walker Zimmerman. Um, you know, well, he's unavailable now after that injury in the in the Champions well, League game. Well, not only that, but if you look at the Nashville side, they had 10 changes to that lineup, right? So this is very much an alternate rotation after they had uh, Nashville Miami played on Thursday night. So Sunday. So we expected some rotation, um, you know, and I think that the Galaxy were sort of prepared for that first half. Uh, and yes, maybe a reaction to that, Kevin. I think more probably a re reaction to 
uh, all of the guys who they also turned over and sort of said, hey, you guys get to rest because they will be playing again in Miami this this week. Um, so they have quick turnarounds on all of this stuff. Um, but when you look at this and, and what this game was, you look at the first half and the LA Galaxy were a dominant force in the first half. Um, a good bit of play for them. Uh, the Galaxy had chances. Um, they didn't capitalize on those chances, particularly whenever you look at uh, at Dejan Jovalich, who was taken down inside the box and then went for his penalty kick. Now, second game in a row, um, you know, uh, excuse me, uh, second time in the first three games, the LA Galaxy get a penalty kick and don't convert. Um, they, this has not been a good look for them so far. I will say that talking to Greg Vanny about Dayon Jovalich and his penalty kicks afterwards, Greg did go into some detail and says, we've been having guys take penalty kicks like every, every day of the week. Right. And he said, Jovalich was five for five. He goes along with some other guys who were five for five. He goes, so I had no issues sort of taking, putting, he's, he's saying, I have no issues with it. He goes, as a matter of fact, I think if you listen to his response and I'm paraphrasing, he says, I, I almost, he goes, it was almost a really good penalty kick. He goes, for me, if I'm taking that. I want it to go a little bit higher. And basically, in this particular game, he hit it down the center, right? And uh, the goalkeeper for Nashville, uh, Panico, uh, made, a, made a great save with his foot, right? So he's jumping away from the point where the, uh, where the, the shot is taken. He's going to the post, and Jovalich hit it down the center. And he said, Vanny was saying, if you're going to hit it down the center, one, you either need to give time for the goalie to get out of the way, which I thought was a, an interesting thing. You're correct, right? He goes, or if you're going to hit it hard, you need to hit it higher. So that way you can get it out of the way of the goalkeeper as well. And that's something that Jovalich didn't do. But that would have put the LA Galaxy up one nothing in that first half, Kevin. And really could have changed the course of the game because I thought the LA Galaxy for large stretches of this game were the much better team against a depleted Nashville side. Um that didn't happen though. So, well, I, I yeah, penalty kicks. I mean, the Galaxy are going to have to solve this problem. But uh, you know, Greg saying that some guys, you know, Jovalich was five for five in practice, and some other guys were, the, you know, the difference between taking a penalty in practice where there's nobody around and it's all your teammates and everyone's giving you a hard time, and taking it in a game in an opposing stadium where you know people are going crazy. That's the difference between making a free throw in practice and making it in the seventh game of the NBA Finals. It's it's a huge difference. And, you know, I think most players will tell you that um, the mental side of a penalty kick is much bigger than the physical side or even the planning, the calculating side. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't doesn't surprise me. Um, just looking at all of the all of the things that the galaxy and again, he was asked if he's you know going to make changes. There seems like there's some guys on here that you'd really want to give penalty kicks to. Diego Fugendez comes to the top of mind for me. Um, you know, look at Joseph Painsel. I would I would let Painsel take him right now, right? Give it to the guys who have the confidence, who know how to make them. The Galaxy are well below league average in, in making penalty kicks, right? And so it's about trying to change that average. And quite honestly, they're shifty enough. They're a big enough problem that scoring for them should be rather easy whenever they get penalty kicks, they're going to draw more, right? They've already got two in the first three games. Now the Nashville, t this Nashville game, also the last time those two teams played, I believe there were three penalty kicks in that particular game as well. So this is very much a, t a side uh, or a tie one that the LA galaxy have never lost in Nashville. Let's keep that in mind. Um, and two is that there seem to be a lot of penalty kicks in these games. Uh, Nashville decided to play back, sit back, let the LA Galaxy do a lot of controlling. And so if you look at the passes and the number of passes that the LA Galaxy completed in this, it's higher than sort of the normal in the first two. We asked if Nashville was going to be the first big test for the Galaxy. You're on the road. You're against the Gary Smith team. Gary Smith teams are defend first, defend as a group, stick together, uh, and then counter on their way out of that. And that's what I think you saw in this game. Um, and that's sort of where you where you get into it now. Galaxy end up giving up two goals in this first half, Kevin, or excuse me, in the second half, the early parts of the second half. Um, one on a penalty kick. Yeah, one on a penalty kick. And after a wonderful, wonderful run by Joseph Payne, Paintsill runs all the way back in order to track down a guy who's breaking up the left-hand side. Um, the Galaxy were trying to cover, and so they were getting countered a little bit. Paintsill probably runs, I don't know, 75 yards in order to get back and then wins the ball on the end line. He takes one guy out, and as Greg Vanny says, he tries to eliminate another guy by cutting inside. Well, uh, for, unfortunately for him, it was a good step across by, by that particular player. Uh, and then Paintsill bungles into him. The guy was always looking to fall down, absolutely, but it's 100% a penalty every time. Yes, you could call it soft. I'm fine with that as well. But they end up doing that, uh, and then Teal Bloomberg comes in and buries that that penalty kick. Well, and that's a weird case because, I mean, and you hope that it doesn't make Paints so less aggressive because a, a lesser player, somebody who wasn't hustling, isn't anywhere near that. There's no penalty because he's not anywhere near the ball. But Paints so was, was really, you know, work rate was really high. He was hustling on that play, got himself into a position a lot of players wouldn't be in, and it turned up 
working against the galaxy. And you just hope that he takes the right lesson for that. It's like, this is going to happen one in a million times. And it just got me this time. Yeah. I, I mean, ultimately, uh, what he, uh, Vanny called it fatigue brain. He goes, sometimes you get fatigue brain, right? You just ran all the way back. You made a good play and you think that you're unstoppable now. And, you know, basically you go in and try to try to pull something and, and this is what ends up happening. Um, so it's, it's one of those, uh, one of those interesting times where you're like, okay, he's clearly one of the most talented players on the pitch. Nashville was game planning around Joseph Paintsville, right? Um, quite honestly, if you're any team right now, you're probably game planning around Dan Jovalic as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you're probably game planning around Paintsville, and you're able to sort of pick him off and get him out of his game. He was off his game this this year. This is the type of coverage he can expect. I don't know that everybody's going to play five in the back, but dedicating two players to Paintsville is probably not a bad idea because he has ways of absolutely tearing you apart. That said, he didn't have a great game. That said, Kevin, he had a left-footed shot that I thought was in the moment he hit it, and the angle on the camera was like right from behind it, and you could see the the hook in it and everything, and it went off the post on the left-hand side. These were times where the LA Galaxy, you know, were real close to either breaking things open or or getting back into the game. Paintsville had a great job. Uh, Paintsville had a great shot. So those types of things. The goals the Galaxy made up: individual mistake by Paintsville, individual mistake by Aude. A ball that gets chipped over. He's trying to chest it to Casares. Well. He didn't really get it right where Casares needed it, and it's in his own box, and maybe he shouldn't do that, and he should clear it out. Aude needs to be better at that. Mark Delgado said that Aude, has, he thought, has been playing really well after the game. He said, absolutely been playing really fine. He's really growing into this, that type of thing. There's individual mistakes. John McCarthy, after the game, we talked to. McCarthy said, um, I said, you know, what about the defense? You guys haven't given up a lot of goals. You gave up two goals this time. You know, what needs to be fixed? And he goes, you know what? It's individual mistakes. He goes, it's not a problem. He goes, our defense played really well. We're really happy with the way they played. We can eliminate ind- individual mistakes. We can make that happen. So the LA Galaxy here, Kevin, are down to nothing. The announcers are calling them dead. The stats are calling them dead, right? Um, everything is, this is, you know, this game's over in the 60th minute, right? We talk about San Jose in the San Jose game. Uh, whenever that one went down, which is you score the third goal, right? And the game's over and you know it. And so ultimately that's what happened in that San Jose game. The Galaxy scored the third goal. And even though Judd gets one and it ends up 3-1, the Galaxy took it and said, this game's over after the third goal. It doesn't matter. It's over. Nashville had a chance to do the same thing. And in fact, they scored a third that was ended up being very well offside. So it wasn't, it did not count. Uh, the Galaxy scored a goal in the first half that was offside that Ricky Push put in. Again, just knocking on the door, keeping everything in mind. This really seemed like a game the Galaxy had in hand, and all of a sudden you're in the 60th minute, Kevin, you're down 2 nothing. What happens last year if the Galaxy are down 2 nothing in the in the 60th minute? Oh, it's 4 nothing in a few more minutes. <laughs> right, because they're going to overcommit. They don't have a good defensive plan. They're going to try to do too much. Now, I did think that there was some panic in the Galaxy. I did think that they tried to, tried to push things too much. Um, but watching Ricky Puj uh, sort of come in and dominate um, in that second in that second half and really put himself in a position to to, to change games, there's a reason he was on the team of the week uh, this year. And quite honestly, there's a reason that uh, Nashville fans were were booing him as well. So uh, Adam, a two dollars super chat says, any thoughts on Nashville fans booing Ricky? Yeah, they were sick and tired of watching the best player on the field get fouled by uh, by Nashville. And every time they got fouled, they got more and more upset at Ricky because they're like, he can't possibly be getting fouled this much. And the correct answer is, yeah, absolutely. He can. In fact, the referee did a really poor job really poor job of managing this game whenever you look at the yellow cards that were given out and everything. Well, well how long has that guy been an MLS referee? Probably a couple weeks, you know? I mean, yeah. I, mean, I Listen, it's the same thing that we've been talking about. I know that MLS media is not going to talk about it. And I know that, you know, the coaches aren't going to talk about it and the players aren't going to talk about it. And there's a whole bunch of other things. But look at that game and watch Ricky get fouled. Yes, we had a lot of these problems last year where we watched Kevin as Ricky Pouge would get fouled and fouled and fouled and not protected. Um, you know, it's not about protecting star players. It's about letting the game continue to play and pulling out yellow cards whenever you had. So Ricky finally gets fouled. I, I think um, at one point Nashville almost scores on one of the times where he gets fouled. 
and Kosteris goes up to the referee and gets a yellow card. So, of course, Kosteris gets a yellow card. Of course, Ricky Pouge gets a yellow card for arguing after he's been dumped so many times. So if you want to know why the $2 uh, on, our, on our question, why were they booing Ricky Pouge is that he was dominating Nashville and the only answer they had was, was to hack him. And well, another thing with Ricky, if you remember the last time they played in Nashville, Ricky got that 90, nine, nine minutes into stoppage time or 11 minutes of stoppage time penalty kick. The one that took like an hour and a half of VAR review to award. And then he made it and, and the galaxy got out of there with a point. You know, I I think maybe some of the Nashville supporters remember that, but the officials, it's it's important that we talk about it because as you said, the coaches, the MLS and and MLS, you know, .com people are not going to talk about it. And it's obvious. Don Garber keeps saying you can't tell the difference. Yes, you absolutely can tell the difference. These officials are not MLS officials. You know how I know that? Because they would have been MLS officials before the strike or lockout if they were good enough. And it's nothing against them. It's not a, a, a bad thing against them. They're not supposed to be there, and they've been asked to do a job that they're not qualified to do at this point. Maybe some of those guys will emerge and become great officials. But right now, what I see is the officials, they got their deer in their headlights. Yeah. Look, and 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 they're 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 uh, trying to um, overcome that by two things. One is let everybody play. Just let the game go. Yep. Don't get in the way. And then the teams notice that. They smell the blood in the water, and they just start hacking each other. And they just it, it, it turns into rugby because the players know they're not going to get a foul. So yep. if they're if they're beat on a play, rather than try to make a tackle or make a play or or help, help a teammate, they just knock. Uh, hope a teammate helps them. They're just going to knock the guy down, and it becomes rugby. The other thing is the official wants to say, "Hey, yeah, sure, I was in League Two last week, but I'm an MLS official right now, and you, Lionel Messi, you get a red card or whatever it is." And they over officiate and they overcompensate. Um, and so th- those are the two problems. They're not letting the teams play, and um, and and it and sometimes it takes 15, 20 minutes if you watch. For the teams to figure out, is this one of those guys that's going to let us go, or is this one of those guys that's, that's going to give a red card for kicking or a yellow card for kicking a ball out of bounds? as happened to Mark Delgado in the opener. That's that's not a that's not a bad shout, Kevin, because we know that that players know referees. We know that coaches know referees. We know that they're part of the game plan. Like if you're getting somebody and you're like, hey, this this guy is very much a yellow card guy. This guy is very hey, watch this guy. He likes to give out red cards. You know, you got to be really careful whenever you do all this stuff. Right. Pay attention to it. And, you know, and so there's like opposition research basically on the referee. You're trying to figure out how they call the game. Maybe you'll go back and watch some of the games they call. This literally jobs of coaches and players to do this stuff. Right. And we know that they do it. And now you don't have any game film on any of these guys. You can't find them. You don't know what they you don't know what their tendencies are. Um, And so you go out there and you sort of have to feel it out in those first couple of minutes. That being said, um, you could see it. So why were they booing? And you're right. Ricky already has a has a penchant for for ruining their fun uh and ricky was out there ruining their fun again ricky here's the thing that is interesting about the la galaxy right now is that you can game plan and try to mark uh, joseph paintsill out of the game go ahead and do it you can uh you're gonna have to commit a lot of resources in order to do it and then vanny even made some tactical decisions inside of that to move things around so paintsill would have some more room um but when we watch and when we look at all these things um i think we can say that uh, you can't stop everybody from the LA Galaxy right now. And this harkens back to a lot of the teams older. There is too much talent on the field. Mark Delgado was saying it. I asked Mark Delgado afterwards, by the way, you want to talk about a guy who has deserved to be on Team of the Week every week so far? Mark Delgado has deserved to be on Team of the Week and, every And time. he's my nominee, by the way, for penalty kick guy going forward. Why, I mean, I why? he'd be good at it. He might I be. He'd be really good at he's, it. He's very stone cold, like nothing bothers him. Uh, talked to Mark Delgado after the game. Was, was sort of going stuff. And I, I don't know, there was just something in the way that he asked that he answered one of the questions that I asked. And he was sort of saying, he goes, we have the locker room. We like being around each other. Like we like playing. We like figuring this out. We like getting problems and trying to solve them. You know, I was sort of asking, what does it say about this team? You come back from two, nothing down because that's what the galaxy end up doing in this score, two goals. Ricky Pouge scores. Dayon Jovalic scores, right? Had a chance to win the game. Um, there are bunches of things that you can take away from this. And, but the big thing I think you should take away is that yes, they were disappointed in not getting the three points, but they understand that coming back from two, nothing and getting a point on the road is really good. And it keeps the momentum going and it keeps everything going. They're still undefeated. And they just did something that you don't do a lot of, which is you're down two goals in the second half and you end up coming back and scoring. Not um, even the goals. second half, late in the second yeah, half. Yeah, late in the second, 60th, you know, in the 60th minute, and you're already you're already cruising by and things are things are happening, right? So you get those two goals. Um Paintsel was one of the things I wanted to talk about. Ricky Pouge was one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um the other thing is Dayon Jovalic. And th- this is an easy game to look at him and say, oh man, he didn't have his best game. 
And I'd argue maybe he's had his best game so far this year against Nashville. Um, I thought a lot of the movement was there. He was a lot more involved. Um, and I liked, I, I mean, listen, I still don't know how he missed that one in the, in the later stages where he's running towards it. And the game production is lacking in replays once again. And we've talked about this last year, but just for the love of God, get somebody who watches soccer to show replays on a regular basis. They never showed a close up of Dayan Jovalich going in and trying to finish off one that looked like it was a sitter. And all he had to do was like run yeah. into it. That was a poacher goal, and, and that's what he is. He's a poacher. He's, he, he's got to get those. Three goals in three games for Dayon Jovalich. There was And could have had five. And could have, have, absolutely. And yep. could have that poacher goal. You know, I saw some stuff on social media where people were saying, uh, maybe it was maybe the game was still going on. Maybe it was when they were down 2 nothing. Where they're saying, oh, the honeymoon's over. Galaxy revert to form. The honeymoon's over. And I get it. If you want to be negative, if you want to look at the glass as being, you know, half empty, you could say, hey, they led it in stoppage time against Miami and gave up a goal. Well, they gave up a goal to Lionel Messi. Uh, you know, he scored against a few other teams. So, but they, they they were really bit by that penalty. If they hadn't got the red card, Delgado would have been right in that spot and everything would have been fine. So you could say, yeah, they 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 gave back a lead in stoppage time in the first game. Okay, yeah, you can say that that's a bad thing. You could say, look, they missed two penalties, um, and they were down two to not, they fell down two to nothing in Nashville. And, you know, that shouldn't have happened. Okay, yeah, you can say that, but you could also look at it and say they could be three and zero. Yep. If Delgado doesn't get the penalty, or if Ricky makes that penalty shot, they win the Miami game. If Dayon scores on either one of his goals in Nashville, they win that game. They could easily be three and zero. So now is not the time to say the honeymoon is over. <laughs> it's not, and and I would make the argument by just with it, by what you just said that the LA Galaxy are actually underperforming where there are where they should be right now. I mean, they are underperforming. Mark Delgado was asked, I think, by Alex Ruiz, you know, is there a next level to this team? He's like, we're just scratching the surface. Um, I thought Jovalich was really good in this game. I thought he was involved. I thought he did all the things that you wanted to do. He's going to score goals. We said in the beforehand that all he's going to have to do is tap in goals, right? And he that's basically what he's done. This was maybe the hardest goal that he scored so far this year was the one that he actually put in, uh, in traffic and cutting back into a... Uh, uh, into the top of the box and having to warp his body around a little bit in order to get the ball in the back of that. Did that. Um, people might complain about his tap-ins, but Kevin, it, it's one is that he's in the right place at the right time right now, that he's poaching, as you said correctly. He's poaching correctly. He's being on He's on the end where he should be whenever they have the ball, and it's dangerous time. So he's doing all those things. There's a next level to him, and he has to find it, though, because well, I, think, and I think he could do it. And we talked about going into the season, and he talked about it. He said he's he set his goal at fifteen. He's got three in three games, so he needs he's, he needs he's on, twelve goals. He's on pace for thirty four. Okay, yeah, right he now. needs 12, 12 goals in thirty one games. But but the other part of that is he scored these three goals in, in in three games. The first two, I don't know that we could say that the paint sill effect had actually taken hold. We saw that in Nashville. If they're devoting those resources to paint sill. It opens the field up for other people, and one of those other people is Dejan jo uh, Dejan Jovalich. It's going to open up for him, and this may be just the start for him. I'm not I'm not predicting 34 goals. I still think 15 to 20 uh, is a really good yeah, number. Anything good over Lord. 20 is outstanding. Kevin, 15 to 20 puts you at least in the Golden Boot race. Top. Uh, no, I'm I'm not di I'm not diminishing that. I'm just it's, saying you I, I, three in three games, you might start thinking, well, maybe he's going to score 30. No, he's not going to score no, 30. No, if he gets 15 to 20, that's elite. Yeah, no, it, it, it would be outstanding. And here's the thing is that if he gets 15 or 20 and like 12 of those are, are, are tap ins, people are going to diminish it. Like it's like, it means anything else. Um, and, and, and people are going to say, well, he doesn't get a lot of assist. He's a, he's a poacher. He's a striker. There's no one next to him. If the, if the offense is working correctly, it's like Chicharito, who's he going to pass to? Right, right. There's nobody next to him. He's supposed to be alone up front. Well, well, let's talk about this too. Here's a big takeaway from it. Anyway, I really like Jovalich. I thought I look Jovalich. I'm trying, I'm trying to say it correctly. Jovalich. Um, I really liked him in this game. I thought he was showing the steps that you want to see. Then the galaxy go down to nothing. What does Greg Vanny do? He puts two forwards in, right? Barry comes on, uh, and Miguel Barry's in there. Um, by the way, just going with Miguel on the back of his shirt. That to me, that's that's a little bit uh, that's a, that's a bridge too far for me. Miguel Barry, Mister uh, Atlanta fans were so excited to see you leave. It was crazy. That being said, uh, two notes from this. One is Greg Manny making tactical changes that the LA Galaxy had not practiced much. He talked about it afterwards. He said, we haven't got a chance to really work on two strikers yet. He goes, it's something that obviously we need to do. He goes in certain situations, and we did it, and the team adapted and figured it out. Here's the thing that we're seeing. And 
this is the we talk about the levels of sort of Vanny ball and things that are supposed to happen. Greg Vanny's been here a long time. He has a core group of players who understand how he wants to play now. He's they're they're executing his game plans to what he wants to do. He tweaked things. He moved Joseph Pancel more to the inside and let Delgado sort of float a little bit out or stay back more as a defensive player. That got tweaked in this game. The GLA Galaxy were able to figure it out. Paintsel got more dangerous as the game sort of played on. He was trying to find space in the middle to be away from the two guys on the outside. The Galaxy figured that out. They were able to adjust to it. They were able to fix it. Two two strikers, the Galaxy looked dangerous with two strikers. I'm not a huge fan of Miguel Berry, but for what they were expecting, I think he's he's playing over what I expected him to do already. He was a big body. He fought through tackles. He won balls. He caused chaos and havoc, and he was where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there, even if he didn't score the goal that gets scored with Jovalich, uh there at the at the end to me is is a spacing sort of look there. And I thought the LA Galaxy ran the two forwards and how they played off of each other. I thought that was the best I've ever seen Jovalich play with with another striker. So we're seeing them evolve. But the big takeaway for me is tactical changes within a structure and the Galaxy were able to figure it out. They didn't need to be, they didn't have to practice it beforehand, Kevin. They were saying, this is the change within the structure that I understand, and I can figure it out. If that's the case, Galaxy are in just fine shape. You're not going to have to worry about them. And McCarthy, probably his biggest save of the season after Yamani. You talked about Audis. Audis, Yamani made a a horrible mistake near the end, and McCarthy bailed him out, Mm -hmm. which is, which is what you want your teammates to do. I mean, it it was a great save, uh, but he essentially bailed out his teammate who made a mistake. It, it, yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. So, but we're seeing we're seeing all of these things sort of take place. So, um, the Galaxy had a chance to win this game. The Galaxy had a chance to lose this game. The Galaxy ended up drawing this game. Stay undefeated on the year. Stay undefeated against Nashville. So, for me, all around great times. Uh, I I say you know you sprint to the to the plane with the point, Kevin. You you get there and you're like we got a point. Woohoo! We did it. Get on the plane and go home. Um, as quickly and as fast as fast as you can get home, get rested uh, and get ready for Saturday against St. Louis. So uh, for me, it was really interesting. Also showing if we look at <clears throat> just the shooting breakdowns and everything that we've sort of seen, if we go to the XG just to figure out where the galaxy at 2.3.7 of that is going to be the penalty kick. So overall, a fairly even one, but 0.7 is the penalty kick for Nashville as well. So really, Nashville had a lot less danger than the L.A. Galaxy need to see them convert on chances that they missed, but um, the mom- the momentum's still there for me, Kevin, so I'm, I'm still and, on board. Four road points already in two games. They got 12 all last year. You know that, right? Yeah. 12 all of last so, year. That's, that's So crazy. again, you can, you, can, you can look at it and say, well, the Galaxy, you know, the, the two of their games are draws. No, well, they're undefeated. I yeah. mean, again, the idea of, of trying to be overly negative three games in, I don't think that really helps anything. Um, it, it, you would have taken this last year. I mean, if they had yeah, but been undefeated three games in the last season. Here's the thing, though, and we've seen, and let's go to the chart just so I can show it to you, because this isn't like a crazy start for the LA Galaxy. This is not, there's like 10 other teams have started better than this LA Galaxy team in 29 seasons, right? The the LA Galaxy um, have, have started better than this. There's 10 other teams, right? Nine points in 1996 and 2010, uh, seven points in 98, 2000, 2002, 2013. By the way, the last time the LA Galaxy had seven points uh, through the first three games was in 2013. Um, so that's still even a long time. Six points, though, in 2022 and 2021 after the first three games, right? The Galaxy sitting on five points. The big difference whenever you look at any of these other ones is that the way the Galaxy are playing is it feels like they're underperforming, not overperforming. And in some of these other teams and, and some of these other years, perhaps that wasn't the case. Um, so for me, you're seeing it with your eyes that's telling you that this this is different, that these five points that the Galaxy have gotten through their first three games and two of those have been on the road, well, only one of those at home, those points feel different than than maybe some of the other points. It, it's, it's difficult to make that 100% saying, Kevin, because we're three games into a season. Right. But we we sort of said we feel something different after the first game. We said we definitely saw something different in the second game. You're still feeling that feeling in the third game. So you're waiting for it to fall off. And I think we're waiting for the Galaxy to really face adversity. This was the first time they faced adversity. So this was the first time this year that they allowed the first goal. Right. And in fact, they allowed two goals in rapid succession and they're down two nothing and they come back to the draw. So I think we're learning things about this L.A. Galaxy team. They still need to get somebody like Gabriel Peck 
into the um, into this fold and figuring out what he's going to do because I think they're going to need him. If you're going to put the resources on Paintsville, like we were talking about, Kevin, if you're going to put the resources on Jovalich or Puj, then you want one more guy out there, and I think that Peck is going to be that. Uh, real quick on Peck, uh, married this weekend. Uh, he posted Speaking on of Instagram. honeymoons. Yeah, uh, married uh, married this weekend. Uh, <coughs> posted uh, these photos on his Instagram. They look very happy. I don't know if there's a honeymoon or anything, but I would imagine there probably isn't. Uh, people asking, certainly, why uh, why Gabriel Peck was, was getting married during a game and everything. And, uh, I just like to remind the people in the discord and people around, it's almost like weddings take maybe up to a year to plan and, you know, all these months and you're a footballer and you plan it like maybe in an off season sort of time that was going to work for everybody. And so you do it and then you get traded to another team and they have a game on and you're like, Hey, what a hey, coach, what, I got to go get married. Like this is, this is something I need to do. So he goes and does that. I don't know what his status is and whether or not he'll be back with the team. We're going to expect to find that out here a little bit later. Um, but I would hope that he would be back for the St. Louis game because they're going to need him. They're going to need him quickly. You want to get him integrated. We assume he got married in Brazil. He was playing in Brazil. It, you know, it, it, when he looked at the schedule to plan it, it probably was like, hey, we're off that weekend or we're playing at home. I can do it the day after, whatever. By the way, the Galaxy now eighth in the Supporter Shield standings. I don't think they ever got the eighth last year. Maybe not. I would have to go back and look to, to sort of check. But no, you're right. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on when we look at the points per month. Uh, the LA Galaxy currently undefeated through the season, but also undefeated in the month of March. Uh, still three games to go in this uh, in this month. So that's something. You talked about the standings and... Uh, uh, somebody was showing us this MLS tracker, which, by the way, you can actually like look it up on the date and find out where the LA Galaxy were on this date. So it's useful for us here. Kev, we should pay attention. Uh, but the LA Galaxy going basically from second down to third in the Western Conference, right? And then if you look at fourth down to eighth in the Supporter Shield, that's to be expected with the draws. Um, nothing that's crazy there. Um, one of the other things I wanted to point out is that already in the first three games, the galaxy are on an unbeaten streak of three already. So, uh, that's something seven was their largest in 2023. Um, and you can see that you can go unbeaten a lot of games whenever, uh, and not get too many points. Right. So the draws eventually need to change into wins, but for right now, I think everybody's pretty excited about it. Um, let's see what else we have here. Just scores around the, the league. If you wanted to watch that one, do you see the Philadelphia and Seattle game get delayed? Did you see the, did you see that? Yeah, pitch? You know what that I have to say, I saw that and, and I had a number of thoughts. One was the, the, the conditions the U S women's national team played in were much worse than that. I thought, and, and you know, the Philadelphia Seattle game was rightly called off. That was terrible, but the women played through worse conditions than that. And then I think you, you really do have to, you know, uh, you really do have to look at Steve Turendola getting the $10,000 fine for, criticizing the, the officials for going and playing that game in the snow in Real Salt right. Lake. And then they cancel this game in the rain. Right. My feeling is neither game should have gone forward, but Chirundolo is right. If he's feeling like, wait a minute, this is a lot of hypocrisy. My game's canceled and I get a $10,000 fine or not canceled. And I get a $10,000 fine for complaining about it. And then there's not even any snow and they cancel this other game. Yeah. Um, the ball was floating. I, I'll tell you this. The ball rolled a lot better on the snow than it did on that game in Philadelphia. And, and, and it Seattle. didn't roll at all on the snow. So that'll yeah. tell you how bad it was. No. It, so, so anyway, my only issue with MLS right now is that I think, I think Steve should absolutely get a chance to complain. Like, let them complain about that. Like, don't don't find somebody for that in that particular situation. It's a it's a bad situation all around. And maybe it should have. They agreed they were going to play the game. So then they played the game and then it turned bad. And maybe they should have called it. Maybe they shouldn't. But let somebody complain at that point. That's not well, a $10,000 fine. But yeah, that's, no, I don't want to get might... into it. I really don't want to get into it. Steve Trundolo and him complaining about that. Well, I just want to say that if you if you're naming the referee saying that guy is, right. is such and such, yeah, okay. But the fans feel that the fans are upset. They feel that they're emotional, right. and if they the coaches and players say, "Oh well, golly gee, it was what it was." No, no, that's not going to fly. Yeah, um, I, this game, this game, this game more than any other game is built around emotion and passion, and yeah. the players and coaches have to have emotion and passion as well. Um, seeing Austin, I saw a stat, by the way, just looking around the league, you know, that the, that Austin has only won one game since trading Diego Fagundes. That's it. Wow. Last, that, and you know how long ago that was? The secret weapon. That was in the, that was in the summertime, right? Whenever Diego Fagundes comes over to the LA galaxy and you're like, oh, okay, this is great. Austin has only won one game since that. In this particular game, they're winning two, one into stoppage time when they give up another goal, makes it into, into St. Louis. Right. And so St. Louis now, the LA Galaxy's next opponent uh, coming up. By the way, if you want to see an actual and if we're if we're into really complaining about MLS and all the things that are bad with it right now, um, which I am, I'm 100 percent on this train right now. Um, go watch the highlights from Austin 
and St. Louis. And if you look at the highlights from Austin and St. Louis, tell me that a third grader didn't put those highlights together. And somebody said, oh, well, it was probably AI. AI is probably putting together. AI, I guarantee you, doesn't put the same highlight twice in a highlight package. Like one right after another. It's the same one twice. It's a throw in that leads to a goal. And they, they, I watched it and I was like, okay. And then you come back and it does it again. There are highlights in there that do absolutely nothing. And if you're trying to tell the story of a game, a highlight package should tell the story of a game in big chances or good saves or big moments, right? It's not hard to figure these things out. Whoever is doing this for Major League Soccer should be fired, all right? It is horrible. And the quality... I just watched the replay, the game recap of the LA Galaxy um, Nashville game, and the quality was horrible on my Apple TV. How could the quality be horrible on my Apple TV? There's all my other stuff. Netflix gets great quality. I have 4K everything. How does it look like I'm streaming something on on a potato from Major League Soccer? <laughs> what are they doing? The, no, Kevin, I swear, go watch the highlights for Austin and St. Louis. They're horrible. I tweeted about it today. They are atrocious. That that is the, the you, best you get. You got the potato cam, huh? I, well, why are they having Alan, Alan Iverson do the highlights anyways? Yeah, <laughs> a potato. I don't understand that. I don't want to even know. Do I do I want to know that potato can? No, what, what no was, AI, what? AI. Oh, I, Alan Ivers, thank you, thank you for explaining you see, that to me. But, but on those scores, did you see Vancouver? Man, Vancouver is really playing well. Made the playoffs last year, off to a good start this year. Vancouver has always been one of those teams that you you always sort of counted on it as a win or at least a draw, even when you went up there. But man, they're playing really well. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, so I think somebody said uh, say they save all the good quality for messy games, right? They they want to make sure they keep that bandwidth open for for messy. I'm all for, by the way, them capitalizing on messy as much as they want. Go do your thing, but you know, hey, let's pretend you're. <laughs> we're gonna talk about a team, uh, and we were looking up. It was a it's a lower division team. What's the name of the Irvine uh, team that we were talking about in the U.S. Open Cup? Oh yeah, the, the uh, Irvine oh. Zetas or something like that, right? Yeah, okay. Zeta FC. Zeta FC, and like in the th first thing, it goes, "We're a professional soccer team," and it's sort of like you know, whenever a chiropractor's like, "I'm a doctor," right? It was one of those where you're like, "Hey, wait, wait a minute, calm down. You don't need to like, you don't need to come out and shout it, right?" Anybody from New York? Hey, I'm from New York. Yeah, we know, buddy. It's a, Irvine, yeah, Irvine yeah. Zeta FC. And by the way, if you're going to talk about um, uh, M MLS and Apple riding the, the messy wave, you were there in the press box before the at halftime of the first game or before the game, right? Yeah. When Don Garber came in and talked about, we're more than messy. This is a complete league. We're more than messy. Yet, like you said, you watch any of their uh, highlight packages, you watch any of their shoulder programming, you, you, you read any of the press releases, and it's all about a messy league soccer. Yeah, it's, it's, I know. It starts and stops with Leo and Messi. I know. And, and like you said, that's fine. Right. You get the greatest player in history, ride that horse as long as you can. But then, you know, don't turn around and tell us it's but, all about the completeness of the league. But lift everything with that, right? Like, you're like, oh, well, we need Messi in 4K ultra high definition. It's like, well, good, then everybody. And by the way, picture quality during the game was fine. I have no issues with it whatsoever. The replay package that I went and just played here, like, you know, an hour ago before I, I'd already watched it a couple times, wanted to watch it one more time and said, Oh, I'll put it on the big screen, do the whole thing. Horrible, absolutely horrible. And I don't know why. So that can't happen. You can't have this stuff happen. Whenever you're selling a premium product, you're pretending like Lionel Messi is the biggest thing. And that major league soccer is this professional league. It's almost like, you know, Hey, we're a professional league. We're, we're number one in, in the United States. It's almost like you have to say it because nobody believes you. So do something. By the way, I got called out for, for Taylor Twelming, T Taylor Twelming in this, which is what are we doing? What are we doing here? <laughs> What are we doing? What's happening? This right? cannot be allowed to happen. This is this is this is ridiculous. So anyway, um, you know, looking at those stuff, that's that's what we got. Highlights, just some things I wanted to pull out of certain players. Dayon Jovic becomes the fifth player in LA Galaxy history to score in his first three games of the regular season. Uh, I believe the last person to do that was in 2010, where it was Mr. Edson Buttle. So it's been a while since that's happened. Um, in his 69th career appearance across all competitions from LA Galaxy in the 2-2 draw against Nashville, Mark Delgado created the game-high five chances, completed 57 passes, 90.5% completion, and then won four of six duels, duels and won two tackles. Yet, yet, Kevin, when I go over here to Team of the Week, I see no Mark Delgado. Now, I do see Ricky Pooj, and Ricky Pooj, good on you, because Ricky Pooj deserves to be on Team of the Week. But when is MLS going to be brave and put in Mark Delgado into the team of the week because he they, they deserves the to be there. They watch the highlight package. Oh, that is awesome. And it, so they turned it off. That's such a good, that's such a good knock, Kevin. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ricky Pooch has been playing very well. Uh, and so I don't want to take anything away from what he's been doing and how he's been doing it. 
Um, but Ricky Pouge, uh, three matches played, two goals scored, 8.24 average rating, three shots on target per 90, 84 accurate passes per 90, eight accurate long balls per 90, eight chances created, 18 duels won, five interceptions, and 18 recoveries. Oh my God, recoveries. Is he playing defense now? He is. See, we said if Ricky Pouj wants to be in the MVP conversation, Kevin, if he wants to be the next level, right? He wants to go. He wants to go back to Europe. I feel like he wants to go back to Europe. He wants to go play with somebody and he wants to shove it in Barcelona's face that he was always this good player. He needs to be a defensive player on occasion. And I think he's been doing that. He's been playing enough defense. In fact, he tracked back and actually got a foot on a cross late in the game that ended up breaking up a play for Nashville. And it was like those big things. You're like, that's what he needs to do all the time is track back in me. I think he's bought in and he was passing to Jovalich. They were clapping. They were doing things. They almost ran into each other once, but we'll let that one go. This team has some chemistry right now and I think they're they're doing it. So anyway, that's that's just me. So it'll be interesting to see when Peck comes back. I mean, th- this chemistry has been allowed to form since Paint Cell came in sort of the last three weeks. Pick coming into that, does he add to that? Does he detract to it? Is he I mean, sort of the... he's played though, right? It's not like we haven't seen him, right? It's just oh, that true. he hasn't been given the starting spot and like he hasn't been fully integrated sort of into that yet. So for me, I'm waiting to see that. That's the that's the next step that I sort of want to take a look at. Um, I think we talked about it. Miami overall uh, tied for first with Montreal. If you watch that Montreal and Miami game, that was a good one. Uh, Columbus. That was M- Miami finally resting some of those guys. That's well, going to be a they thing were rest- to follow all season. Resting messy, right? And so there was Suarez. So, so I heard that people were watching that saying it was a very quiet stadium without Lionel Messi, uh, you know, being on the field and people there able to cheer for him. You have to worry about hitching your wagons to Messi and then just only getting messy fans that come. Obviously you're going to get that. And you saw that effect whenever the LA galaxy hosted Miami in the season opener. So that's something to watch just as we, we go forward, how they recover. I I'm sure a lot of people said, Oh, what, what's going to happen to the LA galaxy whenever David Beckham leaves. The bottom line is the galaxy had been successful enough, won trophies enough that they retained a lot of people who came in to see David Beckham for sure. Um, not all of them, but even if you got 10% and you kept adding on that, that was pretty good. Uh, LA Galaxy third in the Western Conference, as we talked about, tied with St. Louis, who they will play on Saturday. Uh, we'll have a full preview for that game coming up on Thursday, so you can sort of keep an eye on that. And again, St. Louis City, 7.30 p.m. We imagine kickoff is 7.40 p.m. Uh, we're going 10 minutes in to uh, to the games for that. Uh, the next LA, LA Galaxy match is Saturday, March 16th, so do, make do, sure there. Do you really need the city? I mean, isn't St. Louis by definition a city? St. Louis City, SC. They're an SC, not an FC, by the way, you'd have to remember which ones are SCs and which ones are FCs because that's my life. You know, it was easier, quite honestly, whenever there was only like, you know, 14 teams in the league. And you yeah, can... I, I, I think that's so funny, too, when you have a an FC, but the league is is SC. Yeah. But then you have teams who are SCs and then you have teams who are FCs. And so it's like, well, which one isn't? And the answer is both. Yeah. And so if we're really talking about that, if we're really drilling into it, doesn't that make perfect sense? Because in in the United States, you can call soccer, soccer, you can call it football, football. Like I always, the players, Maya Yoshida comes in and he goes, oh, I can, I, he goes, I have to call it soccer now. It's like, you can call it football. We, we know what you're talking about. Everybody will know what you're talking about. You're fine. Do you remember so, when Beckham was here when he would say football and then would stop and, and apologize to us? Uh, yeah, and, and say, was, "Oh, I meant soccer." No, we understand you, you're, what you're talking about. We get it. You're, you're, yeah. It's like, it's like, okay, we get it. Um, by the way, I, I know we had a, uh, and I didn't get to go all the way back, uh, back to it, but I know that we had a, uh, a, a super chat from uh, Mr. Provino in there, um, and it was a good one. And I was going to say it, but now I can't find it anymore. It's like it did, uh, disappeared from the chat, so maybe it went away. But Mr. Provino, we all always appreciate you and it was a good joke uh so i i I would implore everybody to go to the live chat and watch this on the replay and you'll probably see that joke at the very beginning too so is is the replay going to be better than mls replay it's not shot on a potato so we have a we have a good chance i don't are they using fox soccer's like webcams they used to put in the back of the goal because fox soccer used to have like a like 720p like webcam they would put for the goal cam and it was like horrible so anyway uh gary with a two dollar super chat rad show thank you thank you gary we appreciate it uh we talked about peck real quick u.s open cup I know we talked. Oh, yes. Let, let's let's get to this. And then we have one final thing we want to close on. Um, but we were talking about uh, the Ir- Irvine's uh, Zeta FC, right? Correct. Okay. They play the Galaxy on. Wait, uh, wait. In the- they oh, play go LA Galaxy 2. Let's, let's yes. be clear. Yes, well, LA Galaxy 2 on Thursday, March 21st. Coming right up. That's the first game of, well, the first game for LA Galaxy 2 in the U.S. Open Cup. That'll be at the track stadium uh, next Thursday, 7.30 p.m. Um What's kind of interesting, if you remember, okay, first of all, 
we know the U.S. Open Cup format has been changed all around. There'll only be a, a handful of MLS teams, be a lot of US, USL Next Pro teams. Um, we don't know how this is going to be, how this is going to play out. Um, but one of the things that struck me is in the past, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in the past, uh, players would be loaned down and up. Guys would come up from LA Galaxy 2 when it was a USL Pro team, and they'd play in USL or US Open Cup games for the first team. And maybe some guys would go down and play uh, you know, on, on the academy team or the US uh, USL um, uh, championship team. Remember, Robbie Robbie Rogers learned how to be a defender playing on the uh, USL uh, on LA Galaxy two. No one's really sure. I asked I asked um, um, Will Kuntz earlier today, what are the eligibility rules for this? Like, could you take a Zavaleta, for example, who hasn't had any minutes, any first team minutes? Could you send him down and let him play against Irvine Zeta FC? In the U.S. Open Cup, and he said, well, "We don't really know. No one seems to really understand what the rules are. Can guys from the first team go down? Um, you know, guys, I guess from L- Next Pro would have to be loaned up or signed or whatever. So it doesn't seem like they can go up. But can guys go down and play in these games? Um, that seemed to be one of the great uses of the U.S. USL or U.S. Open Cup, rather, um, for the the first teams that they could get guys minutes and uh, or audition younger players. And I don't know if that door is still open." Yeah, it's an interesting, I, I, you know, I know there's, I have mixed feelings about the whole U.S. Open Cup, right? And, and for me, there's, there's a lot of things to sort of try and consider. And I'm not sure that one is U.S. soccer had plenty of time to make the U.S. Open Cup something and they didn't. Um, And so for me, I really sort of say you let the interest in this cup sort of dwindle and now you're letting MLS basically call the shots on it. So one is uh, MLS is going to do everything that they want to do in MLS's power. That's that's always uh, something that's going to happen there. They want to do what's best for MLS. They don't care about anybody else. Um, And so when you look at that. Uh, it's sort of in in my mind, it, you know, it's like, OK, well, then you needed a stronger U.S. soccer. And, and very clearly, you don't have a stronger U.S. soccer. Right. And you can tell that you don't have um, a, a, a stronger one. Um, so uh, that's my problem with the U.S. Open Cup. I love the history of it. I wish it would stay around. I hope that they do it. I'm not surprised that MLS has taken this tact because MLS is all about uh, the League's Cup. There's so much about the League's Cup, Kevin, and we were talking about this, I think, on Thursday. They're not even talking about the CONCACAF Champions Cup. Like, they're not even advertising where you can watch it. Whenever you go on MLS's page and you look for scores and stuff, it doesn't tell you, oh, you got to watch it on Fox. It's like Apple TV has, has either their contract is so strong or MLS feels so tied that, that they're afraid to even say anything about another per- partner who's going to be showing the League's games. Yeah, it, MLS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Apple TV at this point. And make no mistake, the reason there is no U.S. Open Cup or, or widespread participation is because MLS doesn't get money for it. U.S. Open, U.S. Soccer gets all the money, broadcast rights, everything else. Apple TV can't show it, doesn't have the broadcast right. It gets no money. Therefore, the two main players, MLS and Apple TV, who are one of the same anyways, they don't get anything out of the tournament, so they don't want to participate in it. I, I do think it's interesting that the biggest advertisement for U.S. Open Cup is the MLS intransigence with this tournament because last year we didn't care about it. We didn't talk about it. No one paid attention to it. Nobody went to the games. And then all of a sudden MLS said, no, we're, we're going to pull out. And then everyone was like, oh, my God, you can't do this. Right. We love the U.S. Open Cup. Yeah. Exa- I mean, that's a, the problem is that it's the oldest one of the old, the oldest tournament in the United States, 1913, one of the oldest tournaments, I think, in the world uh, that's been continuously run outside of the, the pandemic year. Um, which I still think they should have tr- figured out a way to play some U.S. Open Cup games during the pandemic. So that way they could have said that it was continuous. But um, looking at all those things and, and how they put that together, I love the history. I love talking about the old teams. I like uh, Bumpy Pitch used to have the uh, have the old sort of, uh, you know, the Fall River Marksman or Bethlehem Steel FC. They had the old shirts and I love that stuff and I love the history. Um, but again, U.S. Soccer did this to themselves and they allowed MLS to do this to themselves. Well, and so when, when you... Yeah. When you look at the history and that's and and soccer supporters love history. I'm talking about the old teams. So when you look at the history, the most successful club in US Open Cup history was the LA Maccabi team, which was right here. It was a team that played on the west side. It was founded by uh Holocaust survivors, the Holocaust survivors, the families of Holocaust survivors. Uh some of the players had played in the Israeli Premier League. There was also uh a guy who's father was a, a Nazi officer played for that team right. of, with Holocaust survivors. It was kind of a great mesh and story. And they played against teams like the San Pedro Croats. And I mean, it was a really, I don't want to say it was a fun time, but it was a certainly a different time. And when you look at the history, 
it, it kind of makes brings the game to life a little bit. It, it certainly wasn't the antiseptic professional game that you see now. Gary, I think we got to your super chat, but just in case you said uh, rad show. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. We appreciate the $2 super chat. We appreciate all the super chats really helping us, uh, you know, sort of level up graphics and do a whole bunch of other things. So we got a lot of stuff planned. Uh, still thinking about some other things. I went on Discord today and I said, hey, what if we did some stuff? And so if you join our Discord, you can get over there. Um, so we're thinking about possibly doing some live shows. I haven't even told you yet, but we're thinking about doing a, another live show. We'll figure out when that is and how that is and how we can I, integrate that. Yes. I thought we were going to do the El Pescado show. Oh, oh, the El Pescadito? Is that oh, El Pescador? Pescador. El Pescador. Yeah. Um, we're working on that one. We're, we're, we're just, it's simmering. It's simmering in the background. I, I have to have a free weekend. That's really the problem. And so uh, that's always difficult to do because I never have a free weekend. This weekend, as a matter of fact, on Saturday, game day, I have, uh, there's free rides with the train club. So I'll be there early in the morning to help get trains out. Then C- my COG discount. COG discount always. Um, 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. at Fairview Park, O-C-M-E, trains.org. You can find all the information there. Um, so that's something. Uh, I have, my son has a birthday party to go to, so I will be taking him to that birthday party. So I'll be leaving the trains, taking him to a birthday party in Orange. Uh, and then whenever I'm done with that, I will come home, I will change, and then I will get in the car and I will drive up to the stadium. So that is my Saturday. And then Sunday I get up and I'll drive trains all day again. So, you know, you've been talking about getting Will Koontz and his, and his kids over to the train. I'm, I'm, thing. I'm any LA Galaxy member. All they have to do is hit me up. Anybody who works in the front office, I offer. I, this is this is free and open to everybody to enjoy. So. Uh, well, I'm just thinking we should have an event. If Will gets out there with his daughter, right? I was, right, I was thinking about daughter. doing an LA like, Galaxy like kind of event where we can invite what? people out, but I just don't know if that would be, I don't know if that's a good crossover. That just, to what me, about, it doesn't feel like that's a good crossover. I like the cruise with Koontz idea yeah that's a, uh, let's see uh, let's see if i can I figure out uh uh no i can't figure out any other names right now that i could have a fun <laughs> pun with but uh but that's one of the things but no we're trying to do some stuff um definitely to 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 have more live shows and more events so uh keep that in mind and we'll, we'll definitely i would still like to do a dinner where you and i host a podcast but everybody comes to a restaurant you pay for your food you do the whole thing and as you're eating as a, like sort of as you're finishing your meal and you're getting to the dessert part is we have like this really sort of let's answer questions and tell you about the la galaxy and stuff that like you know maybe we don't get to, into in the podcast well, and maybe have Pesca- an la galaxy guest that's where we do it el pescador uh, yeah. but having i don't know when should we come on i mean because if we're the dessert then everyone's gonna throw up the main course right right by the way i got jams a very very good point here uh, Kevin Ryder, Kevin and Bean, uh, Kevin and Sluggo was supposed to join us on Thursday night. Uh, he no showed on us and, and he knows this. We, we've already talked about it. The whole deal, uh, his, his car actually broke down and he was stuck on the side of the freeway. And so it was a whole deal. Now, yes, that's a very obvious excuse, Mr. Kevin Ryder, but I do believe him. Uh, so we're already working to get him on another show. So don't worry about that's that. That's the non-panda Kevin. That's the non-panda. That's the, that's the actual person who knows how to do radio, Kevin. So... <laughs> Um, you know, that's the nice Kevin, as, as, as we say sometimes. All right. So, oh, you um, could, you, you could have some, a morning radio jingle for him. Yeah. I mean, we could, we he probably already has, he, one. he has his own, he doesn't need mine. Yeah. So anyway, so we will get Kevin on here. All right. Let's close up the show with the last piece of information and boys, this will, oh, fun yes, one. yes. <sighs> All right, here we go. Uh, put on professional face, uh, Tom Bogert reporting after, uh, of course, uh, uh, was already another report from, uh, Fabrizio. Uh, Fabrizio Romano, we have to do the hand when we do that. Fabrizio Romano reporting former LA Galaxy technical director Jovan Karofsky in advance talks to join AC Milan's front office. Role would be to lead the Milan second team. Uh, the American exec was with the LA Galaxy 2013 to 2024. Uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic pushing for Karofsky. So let's just talk about this briefly. It's, it's certainly interesting. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And I will tell you why this doesn't surprise me. Kevin, I think you and I will both say the same thing on this is that Zlatan Ibrahimovic absolutely loves Jovan Karofsky. Uh, there has never been a more glowing review of Jovan Karofsky. I don't even think Jovan Karofsky's mother would say as nice of things as Zlatan Ibrahimovic did about Jovan Karofsky for whatever reason, Kevin. Yeah, we, we still don't know why. He just, he likes him. He loves him. He thinks he's the best. He called him a bulldog, that he was just persistent, that he was always there, that he was talking. I mean, when they signed, when Karofsky signed Zlatan Ibrahimovic, I'd actually asked him to come on the podcast to talk about the victory that he got, because that's a victory. Uh, If you get Zlatan Ibrahimovic, you should be able to hang your hat and hang your career on that. That being said, going over to AC Milan and being part of the board there and running, you know, AC Milan's second team there is a really big job and was Zlatan vouching for you? 
I would imagine that opens some doors. So, uh, you know, if you talk to the right people and do the right things uh, in your career, even if his career with the LA Galaxy, Jovan Karofsky, and what he was sort of done in the upper echelons of management wouldn't be considered successful by almost any metric, that's that's what you could get with Jovan Karofsky. He could be going to LA I, Galaxy too. Or you LA, may be getting a little AC bit ahead of yourself. I don't know that he's running the second team. I think he's working with the second well, team. Well, oh, certainly, in, I mean, and that's the idea. Is, but the idea was that... He, Fabrizio Romano reported it as joining AC Milan's board, and then it was clarified as joining as as being being. Let's see, uh, let's go to Bogart again. Uh, let's pull it up. Um, role would be to lead Milan's second team. Okay, so there you go. well, you see, you there you go. Pre- well, I b- before Tom's report came out, I got a, an, an email. I'm looking at it now from a, a over the weekend reporter in, in Italy, and he said, "Do you have a way I could get in touch with Jovan Karowski? And I looked, and I thought. Uh, why would you want to do that? Right. So I, I sent, I sent him contact for Jovan and then he messaged me back and said, uh, Jovan seems closer and closer to joining AC Milan. Right. Um, so that was my confirmation on this. And when he sent it, it was like out of the blue. It's almost like, Hey, you remember that girl we knew in high school? Do you know how I can get in touch? It's like, why would you want to, what's the, what's the connection there? And so, I had no idea that, that that that's where he would wind up. You know, he does have a ton of contacts in Europe, mm-hmm. but he played in Germany. Yep. And I always thought his con- he had really good contacts in France. I wouldn't have been surprised if someone said, "Look, you know, um, uh, Marseille wants wants to have him come over." That that would have made sense to me. The the Italian thing kind of came out of left field for me. It, it makes sense whenever you put it in the Zlatan Ibrahimovic again. Yeah, when I, he, yeah, Zlatan. Once there. you connect those dots, it makes a hundred percent sense. So, um, and Zlatan has a ton of pool with AC Milan, so it doesn't surprise me there. We'll follow that story as well. So a lot of stuff going on in the LA Galaxy land. Um, obviously, some with, of it on the field, some of it on the field, some of it in the bars. Um, so all of those things going on. We're going to keep on track and checking those as we go out through the week. Um, overall, I think a really successful week for the LA Galaxy in terms of on the field stuff. Uh, self-inflicted wound to the foot on the off the field stuff. But um, I think Nick is just lucky that the LA Galaxy are playing well because if they're playing poorly, uh, this would have a different feeling to it. I'll tell you right now because most I've seen most fans' reactions and they're like, okay. <laughs> and then next, you could know, you imagine if this happened last year? To, at this no. time last year was the supporter mm-hmm. boycott. And, no, uh, they'd be burning the stadium down. And the the uh, that's what I'm saying. So um, again, it almost feels like it's an outlier in the culture that is currently Winning happening. Winning cures but- everything. Winning or drawing, as the case may be, it cures everything. We'll see. Let's see how this plays out. Again, there's still some red flags for me on this one, so let's see how those play out, and then uh, we'll we, maybe uh, the LA Galaxy and everybody will come to a final decision. But um, you know, as it stands right now, it seems like everybody's in investigation mode. So that's what we got. All right, uh, the LA Galaxy will face off again against St. Louis coming up on Saturday, March 16th. Get your tickets. 7:30 p.m. is your kickoff. 7:30 p.m. is your TV time. We imagine 7:40 p.m. is your kickoff time. MLS likes to hide that now because they're sneaky. Uh, MLS season passes where you can find that, but two teams both tied for the same number of points, uh, in the Western conference, uh, playing on Saturday night again. Another and if you really missed the game, you can watch that sparkling highlights packets the next day Just, on the potato. I would, potato char- cam. I, w- I literally would charge like only 150 or $175,000 a year in order to do replays for every game. Like it, it's not that hard. It really is not that hard. I would imagine they even have an identification system in their media stuff where like you can hit a little flag and it'll be like, this was a key. Like you're watching the game and you hit the flag and it goes, okay, I can come back to this. And like you can basically build like uh, like game recaps from that. It can't be that difficult. Somebody who edits video and looks through this stuff, you're basically just taking a broadcast feed and going through it. There was a ball. Which one? Was it in the St. Louis Austin game? I think it's in the St. Louis Austin game. There's a ball that looks like it may have gone over the line and that would have counted for St. Louis, right? St. Louis? Yeah, I think for St. Louis. But the ball gets saved. Maybe. We don't know. There is no replay of that with a an angle anywhere close to the line. And you would think if you're telling the story that you would go in and find the replay that's going to show that down the line or show the best. And you're going to be like, this is what it looked like. But maybe it showed that it was fully over the line. Do you want to get into conspiracy theories? Let's do it. There are there are definitely some some uh, PSRA referees who are on social media talking about Major League Soccer. All right. And they're talking about the referees who are in there, the scab referees and all that fun stuff. Right. And they're talking about how there's there that they feel. And I don't think there's anything to back this up. So it's an allegation. They feel that Emma, the referees that are in there right now are basically being refereed by VAR 
whenever there's a delay for a yellow card or different things, they're saying that VAR is saying, hey, that needs to be a yellow card, which they're not allowed to do. IFAB doesn't allow you to do that. But basically, the reason that the flow of the game is so slow right now is because MLS is trying to re-referee games from the VAR thing. That's interesting. I totally buy that. I totally buy that. I mean, that, it, that sounds extremely plausible to me. It's it's a conspiracy theory that I find on the plausible range. I'm just saying allegations. There's nothing that I've seen that prove any of that. But one of the things, if you're doing, one of the things that you wouldn't want to do if you are trying to to make all this stuff flow in your direction. And right now, MLS is very siloed. Right? You're expecting them to have this this one sort of idea. Everything is locked into this one silo. Okay? So they're in that. Right. Are they not showing us replays whenever there's a call that possibly was wrong and could have affected the outcome of a game? Because if that ball goes in, it affects the outcome of a game. Well, and, and, you know, another thing as you're you're telling that MLS and the silo and and sort of all communicate, everyone's on the same page. I'm just thinking Pep Guardiola or 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 Jose uh, Mourinho or or Pep Guardiola or or Jurgen Klopp watching Steve Trendle get a fine for talking about the weather. You, th- you think that they're sitting over there going, what? We can't talk about the weather? Or you can't criticize or referees. You know that. I mean, he, listen, Steve knew he was getting fined when he said it. Nobody should feel bad for him. Yeah, I, I'm just talking about the people, you know, in, in Europe, if you went through a whole right. week without criticizing a decision or a referee, it would be like, are you okay? I mean, that's that's sort of, that's the counter to everybody right now is saying that, Kevin, you and I are making too big to deal the referees because there's always problems no. with referees. There is. There's always problems with referees. Watch the NBA. There's problems with referees. Watch the NFL. There's problems with referees. Watch the NHL. There's problems with referees. Watch the EPL. There's problems with referees. This is standard, but you can tell when it drops off and it is dropped off. And that's what we're saying. You absolutely can tell. And for people what? who have dedicated their lives to watching soccer and live soccer the way you and I have, we can see it. And I know the players can see it. I know the coaches can well, see it. And everyone says, well, it's not that big a deal. Look, the best referees aren't on the field. You want the best players. You're not going to take a guy from from Cal State Northridge and put him in there at, at center forward for the Galaxy and say, it's just he's just a player. It's just the same thing. No, it's not. The difference in quality is, is markable. And it, when you do that with the referees, the, there's only one referee. There's 22 players. There's one center referee. He's going to affect the game. All right. He or she. Are, are we, I think, I think we can, we can be. And we could go on like this all night. I know. I know. We've, we've sort of been in that. I actually have to stall because I didn't have the right soundboard pulled up. So then I had to do something else. All right. You good? Anything else you want to talk about? We're good, right? I had nothing to talk about when I came on. As is usually the case. All right. Yeah. If you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter. And why would you? At KBaxter11. That's where you can find LATimes.com for all of his articles covering U.S. Women's and National Team soccer around the world and soccer here in Southern California. Make sure you check it out at latimes.com if you're looking for me on x and twitter at jay guessman at galaxy podcast corner of the galaxy.com is where you can find all of our shows all of the articles i'm expecting something new from catamount tomorrow we'll see if we get that up and running for you as well so we got a lot to get to this week as the la galaxy get ready to take on st louis coming up this weekend all right that does it for me for mr kevin the panda baxter i'm josh pato guessman you've been listening you've been watching to corner of the galaxy from the box on corner of the galaxy.com have a great one everybody You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo. And on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye.